one of the major problems with the discipline of archaeology and um, history is that if it's old, if it's something that's ancient, if it's in that realm of archaeology, then it doesn't matter what that what it is, the archaeologist claims domain on it. Like he claims eminent domain and authority over it, which is crazy because, yeah, exactly. We should be listening to the geologists. We should be listening to the engineers, you know, in particular, the engineers. We should be listening to the, 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 um, you know, the geneticists and the other scientists that well, there's so many things that have happened in these adjacent fields of science that should be affecting that story of history, but it just doesn't happen. So when it first emerged, you know, we, Egyptology, when it first came out, we were very focused on uh, the first thing to the real major leap forward was the was the decipherment of hieroglyphics. So there was a whole study, that, and this is 100 odd years ago now, 150 ish, uh, the decipherment of hieroglyphics really helped. So and that's and that's primarily how we date and relate pretty much most of Egyptian history. It's it's through interpretation of the writing. And that's the that is the core study in a lot of cases of Egyptology and archaeology. Like they're they're there to sort of decipher how these people lived, what their society was like, what their daily life was like, their structure, their kings. And I think we have a really good grip on dynastic Egypt itself, like in terms of what that was like. Mm. Um, but at the same time, like if you you know, when you're looking at ancient objects and you're looking at ancient engineering, the expertise should really be in the hands of the engineers, and that's. That's where they the, the paths really diverge, if you like. It's like historians. It's you know, I it's a it's a joke, but it's like you know, you you archaeologists claim claim authority over ancient objects, but we, you wouldn't ask one of them to engineer the chair that he's sitting on. You, right. you want an engineer to do that, and it's the same thing with geology. I mean, one of the more famous examples of this is is um, uh, Robert Schock, Doctor Robert Schock, who's a professor of geology at uh, Boston University, who who famously redated the the erosion and on the Sphinx enclosure around the Great Sphinx at Giza mm-hmm. uh, to somewhere in the in the in the in the region of you know prior to ten thousand BC, which is well and truly outside of the the dating of um, the dynastic Egyptian civilization. And he did this by looking at the erosion pat patterns that are on the walls of the enclosure. The walls of the Sphinx, yeah. Yeah, on the in the enclosure and said, well that's rainfall erosion. That can only have happened in a period where we know that there was, you know, this was a verdant area that gets a lot of rain. Is that because there was like vertical? Yeah, it's vertical fissures. Yeah. Vertical fissures. Yeah. Yeah, and it's not so. The Egyptologists say, well, it's wind and sand erosion. But you know, if you take that picture of that wall of erosion and you take it without context and show it to any geologist, he's going to tell you it's rainfall erosion. Mm-hmm. And and so you know, Robert Schock's been pretty firm on this, and he thought he had discovered something significant. He went to an Egyptology conference. And uh, tried to present this evidence, and basically got laughed out of the room by the old boy network. They're like, "Ah, pff, you're full of crap! Like we, this is nonsense." You know, they just they didn't look at the evidence. They just dismiss it out of hand, which is the common technique that gets used. And it's really strange, but but that's there's a there's an entrenched dogma in archaeology today, right. and that's why I talk about with this idea of civilization uh, has not shifted, and this idea of history is is has become a a very much an entrenched academic dogma. That is that is tightly controlled by those in the in the ivory towers and the people that are in in you know basically the textbook writers that control the the authority of this and they hand out the degrees and they have mm-hmm. they have the access to the sites to do things. You know, it, there's there's a hilarious example of this is and this is has a it's another discovery in the field of archaeology that should be affecting history, which was the discovery of a of a place in Turkey called Gobekli Tepe. Have you, have right. you heard of Gobekli? Yeah, Gobekli Tepe. So incredible site. Klaus Schmidt, German Archaeological Institute, uncover this in the 90s. They excavate. They keep working on the site. Unfortunately, Klaus uh, Schmidt has passed away. They discover that this site was deliberately buried and they've they've used organic remains that they found underneath this burial to date the site to at least 10,000 BC. So right bang on in that same realm of time that that Robert Schock don't, uh, developed, like, like dated the Sphinx. So ten thousand BC would be how many years ago? Twelve thousand years ago. Twelve thousand years ago. Okay. At least, and that's and that's the youngest date. Like that, it could be far older than that. That's when they think it was buried. Like it was deliberately because they buried. tested some sort of organic material right. there, and that's when it did. But it, that could have been a newer. That could have been a newer date. It doesn't. Right. And again, you can't date the stone. All the the nice thing about that side is because it was buried, and they know it was deliberately buried by the nature of the the chips and the and the, the how it was buried. It wasn't like a natural material that it was buried it was deliberately buried and like put into hiatus for whatever reason and and they and beneath that they found these organic remains so it's like okay we know that what was beneath this burial layer was at least as old as these carbon remains it could be far older and in fact there's been recent discoveries of other 
signs of civilization in in Turkey that that are four or five thousand years older than that. Still, these are, there's a lot of finds being made in Turkey now. It's Karahan Tepe, Tepe. There's cemeteries. There's a lot of discovery being made in Turkey. What's, but what's interesting about this is Göbekli Tepe is a massive megalithic site. Like it's large. It, it's a whole bunch of these different stone circles with with large pillars that have been carved. Some of them weighing up to 20, 25 tons. Really? Yeah, they're huge. And 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 you know they're all got anthropomorphic shapes carved into them in high relief. So they're not like carved into the stone. They come out of the stone. So mm. the rest of the stone's been carved. And it's clearly requires civilization, right? To, 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 for, for human beings to create monuments and sites to that extent, it's a massive site. It's mostly still buried. We've only excavated a tiny portion of it. But they can see what's there through ground penetrating radar and other techniques. But what's obvious to anyone who sees it or reads about it is that it requires a form of civilization, right? You need a population base. You need to have people specializing in different disciplines like stonework and, and quarrying and getting these things together. You need to have a developed uh, ceremonial and cultural ethic that sort of guides you while we're making stone circles. We're doing this, we're doing that. M Martin Sweatman actually thinks they were, it's a, it's a dating system uh, that, that relates to uh, uh, the great year and procession of the equinoxes. That's a whole other topic that there might, might be a lot more involved in, in, in Gobekli Tepe yet. It would require a um, developed language too, right? It must, yes. You yeah. have to communicate. But the point is you, you need civilization for this. And this, so this this gets back to the dogma of of archaeology and, um, and, and, uh, and history itself. So this is an incontrovertible I think to me, evidence of civilization. So, so we are, this is now civilization It's developed agriculture. You need all of this support systems in order to make this happen. So can we move the established date of civilization now back from 6,000 years ago to 12,000 years ago? Well, no, what happened was, is, is that the, the, the people that, and this is, this gets reflected on Wikipedia quite a bit. Um, if anyone is interested in looking at it, I always like to look at the edits page, like who's been making edits on Wikipedia pages, because you'll find a lot of uh, academics. There's uh, a lot of are, fuckery on Wikipedia. There is. Oh, yeah. They uh, just changed not, the definition of a recession like a couple weeks ago. <laughs> yep. Recession got changed. Uh, yeah. So uh, vaccine that may have changed. Yeah. Too. But uh so one thing that has been that was changed on the back of this Gobekli Tepe uh, discussion was was now the definition of hunter gatherers. So instead of saying, "Well, this is civilization," now they've just changed and said, "Well, no, no, just hunter." This was done by hunter gatherers who just like to do some stonework on the weekends, you know, get away from the wife and the kids, and and just make a hobby out of making stone circles. It's then is literally on on the the page for for Gobekli Tepe on Wikipedia, and this is. So instead of moving that entrenched date of civilization back, they're just like, nope, this was done by hunter-gatherers. They were just bored and they had all this time on their hands, so they developed a, an advanced form of stoneworking and large communities to do it. It's so silly. It's What would be the problem to dating the, the, the beginning of advanced civilization back that far? Would it uproot lots of other ideas and concept and and historical dogma it, you know it's it's his, it's the historic to me it's the historical dogma the challenge the problem is is that uh, unfortunately like archaeology it's and egyptology and all these things it's they're not like hard sciences you know they're not like physics chemistry where you have ex, you know hypothesis experiment result and we can move forward with that sort of thing it's a much more of a a, a, a social science or a cultural study so it you, in history, particularly when you go back that deep into history, it's not necessarily objective, right? You, you, you're you're piecing together a a picture that's based on very scant evidence. So evidence that's been through cataclysms and flooding and thousands of years of of quarrying and destruction and and thousands of years of subsequent you know civilizations building on these same sites. Trying to put that picture together is a really complex and difficult thing. And there's multiple ways to interpret that evidence. But what happens, I think, is, and this is my opinion, I, I've talked about it a few times, but I think that the entrenched academics, the people that are the, if you call it dogma and you call archaeology a religion, these are the priests of that religion. It works in the same way, I think, to a lot of, of, of religion. It's like you have a story. You are very attached to that story. Your position of power is attached to that story. So, you know, and it's like you are the authority on that story. This is the, the, the academics and the, and the archaeologists and stuff that are in, in these institutions that have access to the sites that write the textbooks. So when you come along and there's new evidence that threatens the veracity of that story that you've been championing for so long, 
it, it, it's not just like, oh, maybe we'll learn something new here. It becomes kind of a personal threat. You know, you're threatening people's sense of self-worth, their livelihood. So you get a much stronger reaction to it. 